Greetings to baristas. Well, it seems the Western Imperial Powers, meaning, of course, the U.S. and its loyal little lap poodle, the United Kingdom, have decided to ramp up the Syrian civil war. I read from a recent issue of The Guardian. U.S. and Britain to boost support to Syrian rebels, says Kerry. Saudi Arabia understood to be playing lead role in coordinating efforts to arm carefully vetted rebel units in Syria by E.M. Black, Middle East editor. The U.S., Britain, and European and Arab states are to increase all aspects of support for the mainstream Syrian opposition fighting to overthrow President Bashar al-Assad, John Kerry said on Thursday. Speaking after talks in London, the U.S. Secretary of State said he would not discuss specific weapons systems or who might supply them, though Saudi Arabia is understood to be playing the lead role in coordinating efforts to arm carefully vetted rebel units. The U.S. and Britain say they provide only, quote, non-lethal aid, unquote. Ahmad Jarba, president of the Syrian National Coalition, NSNC, had earlier urged the 11 Nation Friends of Syria, FOS group, meeting at the Foreign Office to supply anti-aircraft missiles to help counter Assad's air attacks. Every possible avenue will be pursued by one country or another, Kerry said. I'm not going to discuss specific weapons and what country may or may not provide weapons or be providing weapons, but out of today's meeting, every facet of what can be done will be ramped up and that includes a political effort, aid to the opposition, economic efforts, and sanctions. Jirba spent last week in Washington lobbying for the delivery of manpad portable missiles, stressing the devastating effect of Syrian government barrel bombs dropped on opposition-held areas. He spoke of trying to convince the U.S. to give us those weapons, or to convince them to allow our friends to provide us with those weapons. He made the case again in London. Nobody said no, but nobody made any promises, said one diplomat present. Java's spokesman, Munzer Akpik, told The Guardian, We felt a great deal of understanding for the problem and the need to find a suitable solution. Hopefully, we will find a way. The Foreign Secretary, William Haig, said Britain would accord diplomatic mission status to the SNC after a similar move by the U.S. He also promised increased U.K. humanitarian efforts, with £30 million of extra funding, in particular aimed at getting to areas of Syria that the U.N. has not yet been able to help. Kerry said the U.S. was willing to follow Britain's example and consider funneling aid to rebel-held areas using non-governmental organizations instead of the U.N. We are open to the idea of providing aid through any means that will get to people who need it, and while a decision has not categorically been made, we are open to anything, he said. In a short but strongly worded statement, the FOS group condemned Assad's plan for what they called illegitimate presidential elections next month as a parody of democracy. Under a new coordinated strategy, they place to increase support for the moderate opposition National Coalition, its regime, its supreme military council and associated moderate opposition groups. Repeated use of the word moderate contrasted with the concern they expressed about the rising forces of extremism. Okay, well, this text follows the usual pattern, and if you notice, the UN is being completely bypassed in favor of NGOs, that is, front organizations for the imp in turn, the imperialist international controlled by these subversive foreign powers for takeover purposes. Because these fronts will obey their hidden masters behind closed doors rather than be held accountable by a public body like the United Nations for stirring up international conflict and engaging in an act of aggression through civil war. Which is ironic when you consider that it was these Anglo-American allies who pushed the hardest for the United Nations and its Atlantic Charter during World War II. But perhaps the very title of its founding declaration, Atlantic Charter, shows why the UN has come to seem irrelevant to Washington and London. The body created under its dispensation is no longer Atlantic in composition or outlook and must become neutered and rendered impotent as Hitler and Mussolini castrated the League of Nations. The so-called moderate elements that will be vetted and subsidized within Syria are only those groups willing to take marching orders from the imperial geoplanners in Washington, London, and Brussels. They will get the guns and money. Of course, the others won't just go away. And if these pro-Western groups should take power, there will be a new round of civil war against those being left out, which may un end up in Western direct intervention anyway, to save another beleaguered ally, as we've seen from Korea onward. The usual trope for said masked and not-so-masked intervention is that the regime to be deposed kills its own people. Well, this is unquestionably true. If people are committing atrocities behind closed doors, don't we then owe it to the victims to kick down those doors and worry about the legalities later? Because a number of problems arise. Emergencies can be manufactured or based on mistaken information. The old smoking gun analogy leads to, and is designed to create, 
a lawless society where police power can be used to save lives wherever and whenever it is believed there's a threat. Iraq's falsely alleged weapons of mass destruction in 2003 hardly needs to be raised in said regard, though I just did so. Secondly, the targets for such humanitarian intervention are, as the article alleges, carefully vetted. They are normally states that politically oppose a foreign regime seeking to change them. It's as if a Republican police chief in a U.S. city decided to target domestic abusers known to be registered Democrats while ignoring complaints coming from Republican households. A Democratic wife beater goes to court, a Republican wife gets lectures on family values and biblical submission to her husband's godly authority. Thus we see concern for bleeding victims in Syria, Libya, or Iraq, but not in Turkey or Egypt or Yemen. And I'm old enough to remember when the Western democracies not only turned a blind eye to repressive regimes in Latin America, like Chile and El Salvador, but actively aided not the rebels, but the dictators and death squads, and even put these in power to repress and kill their own people, while trumpeting the Nicaraguan Contras as rebel freedom fighters, exactly as they're now doing regarding Syria. Because there are, as ever, worthy and unworthy victims. The judgment has never left the victim alone as to the value of his or her worth. So much for any universal declaration of human rights, another reason to bypass the UN. But perhaps the most important reason for challenging this imperial cliché is precisely its wording, the killing of one's own people. It's exactly the trousers that imperialist would hide behind because, of course, he, or in the case of Hillary Clinton's skirts, she, kills people other than his own. To narrowly focus the acceptable range of atrocity to this point sidesteps the behavior of the imperial powers of the U.S., the U.K., and their allies and proxies, NATO and Israel. Whatever one can say for the likes of Saddam Hussein and Assad Jr., they have not attacked the powers that hanged one and seek to hang the second. They have sent their armies to attack their immediate neighbors in times past, but there was absolutely no such contingent factor when the U.S. and U.K. launched their invasion of Iraq, or now when the same forces are funneling aid to their Syrian Contra army. So in Western imperial eyes, a domestic feud within a tribe is a greater threat to peace than a foreign tribe taking over another. But the argument can be made that since the first tribe does have a common culture and blood relation, there is a basis for future reconciliation between them that is entirely lacking in foreign conquest, unless the conqueror is willing to assume some degree of assimilation in his conquered colony, of himself or his subjects. But in the modern world, conquest coming from the West, in particular, conspicuously lack this character, whether it's Germany and Poland or Israel and Palestine. So a foreign conquest is always a greater threat of wider conflict and instability than a domestic civil war. The planners in Washington and London know this, of course. They just count on you being too thick to figure it out. You are supposed to be wise and sagacious enough to elect these people, then lose your critical ability once they open their mouths. So let's revamp this article from The Guardian and see the implications for World War III if these actions and motivations were transferred to other conflict zones. Russia and China to boost support to Palestinian rebels, says Lavrov. Iran understood to be playing a lead role in coordinating efforts to arm carefully vetted West Bank and Gazan rebel units, by Mr. Ian e. Black, Middle East editor. Russia, China, and Muslim and Arab states are to increase all aspects of support for the mainstream Palestinian opposition fighting to overthrow Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Sergei Lavrov said on Thursday. Speaking after talks in Beijing, the Russian foreign minister said he would not discuss specific weapon systems or who might supply them. Though Iran is understood to be playing the lead role in coordinating efforts to arm carefully vetted rebel units, Russia and China say they provide only, quote, non-lethal aid, unquote. Salim Zanun, president of the Palestinian National Council, PNC, had earlier urged the 11 Nation Friends of Palestine, FOP, group meeting at the foreign ministry to supply anti-aircraft missiles to help counter Netanyahu's air attacks. Every possible avenue will be pursued by one country or another, Lavrov said. I'm not going to discuss specific weapons and what country may or may not be providing weapons, but out of today's meeting, every facet of what can be done will be ramped up, and that includes a political effort, aid to the opposition, economic efforts, and sanctions. Zanun spent last week in Moscow lobbying for the delivery of 9K-32 Strela-2 portable missiles, stressing the devastating effect of Israeli government cluster bombs dropped on opposition-held areas. He spoke of trying to convince the Russian Federation to give us those weapons, or to convince them to allow our friends to provide us with those weapons. He made the case again in Moscow. Nobody said no, but nobody made any promises, one dip said one diplomat present. Zanun's spokesperson, Hanan Ashrawi, told The Guardian, We felt a great deal of understanding for the problem and the need to find a suitable solution. Hopefully we will find a way. The foreign minister, Wang Yi, said China would accord diplomatic mission status to the PNC after a similar move by the Russian Federation. He also promised increased Chinese humanitarian efforts. 
with 30 million RMB of extra funding, in particular aimed at getting to areas of Palestine that the UN has not yet been able to help. Lavrov said the RF was willing to follow China's example and consider funneling aid to rebel-held areas using non-governmental organizations instead of the UN. We are open to the idea of providing aid through any means that will get to people who need it, and while a decision has not categorically been made, we are open to anything, he said. In a short but strongly worded statement, the FOP group condemned Netanyahu's plan for what they call illegitimate Knesset elections next month as a parody of democracy. Under a new coordinated, coordinated strategy, they pledged to increase support for the moderate opposition national coalition. It's Supreme Military Council and associated moderate opposition groups. Repeated use of the word moderate contrasted with the concern they expressed about the rising forces of extremism. Aha! I knew that would come about now. Hello! Who is it? And this is a bad line. That's what I get for switching away from my lamp phone. Saddam Hussein! I thought you were hanged and buried. Oh, you are? And you're waiting for Prime Minister Netanyahu to join you. Well, wait a minute now. I, I don't want anyone's execution for war crimes and atrocities associated with my video. After all, I opposed your execution and Gaddafi's lynching. But while I do believe leaders should be held accountable for their crimes, I can understand your frustration. Because if you're white and Western, even by adoption, you can get away with murder as long as your victim is not. 